Okay, uh, I think we are live. Uh, so if you are here, if you can hear, then uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this uh, seminar on the psychology of image-based sexual abuse. This is uh, the first one of these types of seminars that we're going to be doing um, at NCU Psychology. We're trying to get more of these seminars online so that we can uh, get different speakers in. Obviously, the coronavirus uh, pandemic hasn't helped things in terms of uh, seminars, so this is a new way of doing things, um, and this is what we are uh, planning to do. More online seminars for uh, external speakers coming in and, and talking to us about their work. Um, as you'll have seen from uh, what we are doing today, uh, today's session is by uh, myself and Dr. Dean Fido. Uh, Dr. Fido is from the University of Derby, where he is a lecturer in forensic psychology. Um, his kind of area of expertise is uh, typically around uh, psychopathy, uh, psychopathy research. Um, he's also got interest in a range, a broad range of different issues, nature connectedness, image-based sexual abuse, uh, to name just a few. Um, he was also uh, a former PhD student, undergraduate student as well at NCU. Um, so we're pleased to welcome him back today uh, to uh, Nottingham Trent University, uh, albeit virtually. Um, and he's still involved with uh, with working with PhD students and lecturers here at NCU. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, kind of housekeeping about how we're going to do this today, um, there is a live Q and A. If you are watching on the uh, on the web, you've got a, a Q and A on the right hand side of your screen that you can uh, add questions to. We will be checking that throughout. But obviously, we are giving the talks as well, so. Uh, bear with us if things don't go on straight away. Uh, essentially, you submit the questions and then we send them live. Uh, we will be doing Q&A at the end of the presentation, so don't be uh, kind of put off if we don't answer your questions straight away. We will get to them all at the end of the uh, seminar. Um, this video will also be going, the recording of the, the seminar will be going online as well. We're going to try and get this onto uh, YouTube, I believe, uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours, uh, just so we can ship as much information uh, out as possible about this uh, important topic. Uh, I think that is everything uh, to discuss about the seminar and how we're going to uh, kind of structure this. Um, essentially, we're going to talk about our research for uh, 40 to 45, maybe 50 minutes, um, and then we'll take questions at the end. But we will be checking the Q&A as we go through uh, the session. Okay, so in this seminar, what we're going to be doing uh, predominantly is looking at uh, kind of what is image-based sexual abuse? How do we conceptualise image-based sexual abuse? What's the legislation around the world in terms of how um, how it's legislated for? Are, are some things illegal, some things not? Uh, we'll also then present some findings from some of our recent work, looking at beliefs about uh, revenge pornography specifically, um, but also we'll look at things like deepfake pornography production or deepfake sexual media production, and uh, Dean is kind of the person who leads on that uh, work, so he'll take you through all of that. And then we'll also give you some ideas and kind of uh, some indications to where our research agenda might be going in the next uh, couple of years. Um, so that's the summary. I will now hand over to Dean, who is going to talk about uh, what is image based sexual abuse. How's it going, everybody? Hope you're well. And um, yes, uh, just to echo Craig's comments, thank you very much for taking the time out of your days uh, to come and watch our kind of free seminar today. We, when when Craig and I set about doing this book, which were also, well, so seminar, which we're also writing into a book, uh, we wanted to make it as accessible to as many people as humanly possible. And so through that kind of mechanism, we oftentimes use words which um, we hope are kind of acceptable that, that you guys can kind of cling on to and understand. Um, sometimes we use more complex terms, but hopefully we'll be able to explain what each and every one of those means along the way. So we're going to start with the broad question of what actually is image based sexual abuse now? It's quite weird having to explain what the title of our seminar is, OK? Um, but we appreciate that lots of you will have come to this uh, session based on the kind of broader terms such as revenge pornography and upskirting. So lots of things which you see a lot of in kind of published media, uh, in the news, what you see on social media as well. Um, so when we talk about these, we can draw on Claire McGlynn's work in terms of describing it as a continuum 
of image-based sexual abuses. Okay, um, and now whilst Craig and I kind of might disagree on the use of the word continuum, which is something that Craig might touch on uh, later, essentially what we're saying is that the, the phrase image-based sexual abuse houses individual um, offences or at least behaviours, because some of these actions aren't actually criminal offences all around the world. And what we're touching on are topics such as revenge pornography, now I'm saying that in quotes because we're going to go into that a little bit deeper. We don't actually like the terminology around that. Um, upskirting, something that has become quite prominent in uh, social media as of late. Cyber flashing. OK, now this is something which a lot of you wouldn't have heard of, but just kind of think uh, dick pics. Think dick pics. And um, we can come back to that kind of a little bit later. And also deep fake media production, which is something that I have a lot of interest in. It's something which can be used for good, but it's actually something that can be used for evil as well. So we're going to jump on to the kind of first topic, which is uh, revenge pornography on the next slide. And when we talk about revenge pornography, I, I say in quotations and I say in quotations not only about the phrase as a whole, but about the phrase revenge and pornography. OK, so according to UK legislation and obviously how we describe it around the world, we shall think of the action of revenge pornography as the disclosing or dissemination of private sexual images. So photographs, films which have the intent to cause distress to others. OK, so if we're teasing this apart a little bit, we have the two key words here, private, which are materials um, which would not normally be made public. OK, and that's actually quite contentious in itself and something that Craig's going to hit on slightly later. And also the phrase sexual, which in this instance is a material which exposes the genitals or contains content that a reasonable uh, individual would consider to be sexual. Now, when we're looking at the kind of um, origins of revenge pornography, and again, I'm using these quotations, um, we look to websites such as isanybodyup.com where predominantly, and I'm saying typically, it does happen kind of um, lots of different types of offenders, lots of different types of victims. But at the time, it was predominantly male individuals who, because they were spurned by an ex-lover or who had some sort of gripe or wanted to kind of detriment their ex-partner, who was mainly female, would upload their private sexual images onto this website and not just share the images, but attach to them their real names, their full names, their work addresses, their work emails, their telephone numbers and their social media profiles. So it was a very sort of invasive and pervasive way of getting back at another individual. So if we move on to the uh, next slide, this is where I'm going to tease apart a little bit of why we don't like using the terms revenge and pornography. OK, we, we prefer the non-consensual dissemination of image based sexual offending. OK, but that's a very clunky term, even though it's accurate. It's very clunky for us to try and get members of the public to understand and appreciate what we're saying. OK, so if we take the, the first term revenge, OK, this has several connotations about it, it almost in our minds instills that this only happens after the breakdown of a relationship and not only after the breakdown of a relationship but where the victim the individual who had their private sexual images shared actually committed some sort of misdemeanor which warranted the offender to share those images to kind of um, get their own back of that individual and of course when we talk about this this actually discounts um, offending from non ex partners. OK, so people that weren't in a relationship and it also discounts some of the more sort of pervasive motivations which might lead somebody to commit this offence uh, in the first place. OK, and such as financial gain, uh, notoriety, you know, so, so for example, uh, look at this person that I slept with, you know, trying to big yourself up to your friends um, and also just for kind of entertainment value or the, or the kicks. Um, and the reason why this is really important is because it does ignore some of the other ways in which these offences take part. So, for example, I've got an image of uh, Jennifer Lawrence on the right hand side of the screen. And now um, around about five or so years ago, Jennifer Lawrence had her iCloud account hacked. Now, her iCloud account was full of kind of it's, a, it's an online storage of your own information. And she had some um, naked images of herself 
stored in that iCloud. Now, along with other um, female celebrities, again, so we're looking at that kind of um, female victims typically, but as, uh, as Craig and I will go on to show, that's not always the case. You can also look at um, uh, Hernan Hall's book for that. Um, what happened was these images were downloaded and then disseminated, okay? It wasn't an act of revenge. It wasn't to get any money out of Jennifer Lawrence. It was purely for kind of entertainment value and because that offender could. OK, so that's a very important distinction to make. Second of all, we come to this term pornography. And again, when you look at pornography, the discourse around is that is between two or more consenting adults or even one consenting adult who is engaging in a consensual sexual act. And those images have been captured. But what this discounts is when these images have been dis um, captured kind of covertly or in secret. OK, and so the term revenge pornography it might actually not be the best terminology when we use it. But for the rest of the presentation, I am going to use that term just to kind of better connect with uh, you, the audience. Awesome. So if we move on to uh, the next slide, I'm going to touch on some of the laws. Now, the laws surrounding uh, revenge pornography are vast and they differ from country to country. In the UK, our laws are pretty set, although in Scotland, they're a little bit more punitive in the UK. But what I always like to do with my students is just to highlight the complete disparity across the world. For example, in Germany, we look at the legislation and it's all around data protection and art copyright laws. Now, if you look at the discourse around being a victim and what being a victim means and the sort of power and control that you have as a victim, we know that being a victim of a sexual crime is something which the general public will perceive to be very serious indeed. But if your victimisation is so, uh, currently being um, kind of contrasted against copyright protection, suddenly you lose that power as a victim. And so it is actually a very kind of uh, nonsensical and very important distinction to make. In France, it's uh, all wrapped in digital legislation. So again, not kind of sex abuse uh, legislation, but digital legislation, although they do have quite a strong deterrence for taking part in that. And of interest, we have the states. Now, at the time of writing, I think 46 uh, states have legislation about revenge pornography, but there's no kind of blanket federal law. And one of the issues with this is that the individual states legislation oftentimes draw on the uses of the terms to with the intent to cause harm. OK, individuals might not always have that intent to cause harm, exactly with the kind of Jennifer Lawrence case, whereby there was no intent to cause harm. It was just for pure entertainment value. OK, and these actual victims might not even know that they are victims in the first place. So there are kind of lots of loopholes that are available in legislation that we do really need to write as a whole world. And more importantly, I include Israel here because we don't just see this legislation in the West, but we also see it in the East, um, where actually this is written as part of sexual harassment legislation, much more punitive. However, when we look at the kind of cases that, that have been brought to court, OK, so we have 643 cases between 2014 and 17, 84 of those were closed because we didn't know who the perpetrator was. OK, so another loophole. As soon as you upload those images, those images can then be shared and downloaded and redistributed by anybody in the world. Um, 108 of those cases made it to court. And when I asked you, like, how many cases actually um, got a conviction, the sad answer is only 17. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit later towards the end of the seminar about the potential barriers that these uh, victims will face. And if it is fear and embarrassment, OK, by having to tell your story in a courtroom, how would you feel if only 17 of these near 700 cases actually reached a conviction? OK, it's quite harrowing reading. Um, so we're going to move on uh, briefly just to talk about upskirting. OK, so upskirting, according to some of the kind of latest uh, voyeurism related legislation, is the act of operating equipment and or recording underneath the clothing of another person to observe their genitals or buttocks without consent. And as it's important to say, you do not need to be wearing underwear or you can wear underwear and it still would be classed as a criminal offence. And we don't actually know from a psychological perspective, we don't actually know too much about this offence, the motivations and the beliefs surrounding it. Conceptually, it aligns very well with voyeurism, OK, and the covert observation of another in a state of undress. And from that voyeurism literature, we see that such behaviours are typically viewed as being an abnormality of sexual interests. 
OK, and in the UK, if we move to the kind of next slide, we have the case study of Gina Martin. Now, Gina Martin is one of the key figures who brought this to actually be an offence. She was just um, having a great time at the British Summertime Festival in Hyde Park in 2017. I think she was watching The Killers and she sadly uh, caught somebody who was taking images up her skirt. Um, she got the individual to delete those images. She went to the police, but was told that actually under the current legislation at the time, there was no way in which that individual could be convicted of the offence which she's um, claiming them to have done. OK, upskirting just wasn't a criminal offence in the UK at that time. Um, what it could have been convicted under was public decency um, legislation or voyeurism legislation. But each of these legislations, especially in the UK, um, come with actual uh, caveats, which means that this particular case would never have got there. So, for example, um, public decency legislation requires two or more individuals to have witnessed the act. And when we're talking about upskirting, so taking covert images up somebody's skirt, um, oftentimes with cameras so small that people don't notice it. The sheer act itself suggests that we that these individuals won't find out. OK, they won't find out at the time. And actually, because their faces, you know, most of the time wouldn't be in these images. If they were disseminated, they wouldn't know they were victims in the first place. Um, however, Gina Martin campaigned and after a second time of reading in court, we haven't got time to talk about what happened in the first instance, although it's, um, yeah, it's quite an ironic story, um, but it, it will feature in our book. Um, actually, this was brought into legislation and now it is a criminal offence as of last year. OK, so moving on to cyber flashing again we're, we're, we're sorry we're kind of covering this in such fast pace but there's so much information that we want to get over to you in such a short amount of time that uh, we kind of thought this was the best way of doing it um cyber flashing okay so typically this is the use of kind of bluetooth sms snapchat communications whereby one individual will send another pi a picture to an unsuspecting individual so when they open that picture oftentimes in a kind of crowded place um, it's there to cause distress to the individual, but also wider embarrassment as a whole. OK, and oftentimes kind of enveloped in this is the act of sending dick pics. OK, but we're not just limiting it to that because the, the terminology of DP itself is kind of um, it almost adds like a, a fun or comical element, which which this offense, it, it really is not OK. It's designed to cause stress and distress to an individual. And most importantly, that at the time that we're giving this presentation, it's not illegal or prosecutable in its own right within the UK. Um, and it is kind of seen under kind of public uh, decency legislation. Now, if we're looking at kind of um, government polls of how frequently or how often this has actually happened in the general public, 50 percent of college students um, report being victims and also 41 percent of women aged between 18 and 36. OK, so that's both uh, dick pics and cyber flashing together. Now, what Craig and I would like to do is kind of tease this apart to see, yes, it is an important factor to research, but just how much of the population um, have been victimised by this? And also, is there anything that we can actively do? And actually, I don't think um, without reducing the, um, OK, so without actual education for the offenders, without reducing the functionality of some of these apps in which the offences take place, it's actually very difficult uh, to police and would require a lot of help from the bodies that make these apps. OK, so just to kind of wrap up the, the four different perspectives, we're going to move on to uh, deep fake media production. And this is one that uh, when I'm talking to my students, they actually find it really interesting. So for those of you that don't know, it's entirely possible for you to take a still image or a series. So let's say we um, and Emma Watson is a victim of this. OK, so let's use Emma Watson as a, as a sad example. We can go online and we can download 100 pictures of Emma Watson's face. OK. We can then use machine learning tools to superimpose her likeness, and this is a very, very close likeness, oftentimes described as being indistinguishable, onto a naked actor or actress, and it can be a still or motion picture. OK, so it's almost as if we're creating pornographic videos featuring celebrities or featuring general people off the streets, family, friends. OK, um, again, there's very kind of limited legislation pertaining to this. Um, Australia are doing great things um, at their end and must be kind of held 
as kind of key stakeholders in the kind of movement of deepfake uh, legislation. Uh, the images themselves are considered very difficult to distinguish. And although um, this is kind of mainly used in terms of kind of memes and kind of making making fun images. So, for example, superimposing uh, Mr. Bean's face onto Donald Trump, on Trump. And I've got an earlier, I've got a picture of that in the next slide. Um, what this can be used for is political interventions. OK, so you could potentially have a political figure taking a bribe or declaring a state of war which you know we might be living in a state whereby these things are more and more believable day by day okay so the kind of the examples that i've got on the next slide so we've um as i, as I said we've got good uses so for example we've got um the use of uh, princess leia so sadly after the death of carrie fisher uh, the film wasn't completed okay so so the later film wasn't completed and so likenesses from a new hope were used to fill in the gaps, per se, of the actress after her passing. On the negative spectrum, you have Scarlett Johansson, who is another victim of deepfake media production. And she makes a case in one of her articles that um, it's very difficult to stop it. Once these videos are out, OK, they are widely disseminated. Uh, pornography websites such as Pornhub and DuPorn both suggest that it's against their terms of services for such videos to be uploaded. However, even when these videos are um, eradicated from their site, new images can be re-uploaded, images can appear on different sites. It's that easy, it's instantaneous. And then obviously we've got the downright uh, weird at the bottom. So if we move on to the next slide and look at the impact of these victims, a lot of the kind of impact work is surrounding um, revenge pornography itself, but we would argue that the impact for all of these offences is quite pervasive. OK, so if you look at the kind of social consequences, we see embarrassment, familial strain, a poor reputation of having your private sexual images disseminated. OK, and this can um, also backfire in terms of jobs. So oftentimes if a if a place of work were to Google you and the first image that came up was a kind of a private sexual image or you engage in a sexual act, there have been reports previously that people have been let off from their jobs or even not hired for jobs due to these images kind of bringing um, down the organization's reputation, which is very harsh because it's almost as if these individuals are being re-victimized time and time again. And this can lead onto both physical and mental health consequences, depression, anxiety, and has been associated with elevated levels of suicide attempts and completions. Okay, and what I would argue to be one of the kind of more pervasive um, um, kind of negative consequences is it helps to perpetuate this victim blaming society. OK, so the work of um, Henry and Powell and Scott is kind of very clear that in individuals who take naked selfies are deemed to be reckless, careless. They should be aware of the consequences of their um, actions. And actually, the blame is put on them in the first place for sharing these images and making sure that they weren't uh, removed from an ex-partner's phone after the breakdown of a relationship. And so we would argue, both Craig and I, that we need to be making sure that the blame and the focus is put on the perpetrators and not the victims of these offences. And finally, before I hand back over to Craig, I want to talk about, even though we've made a clear case of why sharing uh, such naked images can be quite dangerous, and, and, and this, is on the, this is on the next slide, is that actually these images themselves do form a normal process of engaging, developing and maintaining sexual relationships in the modern world. OK, we're living fast paced, complex lifestyles and oftentimes trying to forge relationships over long distances. OK, and actually um, sexting, as it's called, uh, plays a very kind of normative process in the formulation of that. And Again, we should not be kind of harrowing that act, OK, and putting the emphasis on the victim when actually it is entirely the fault and the actions and the blame of the perpetrator themselves. But at the same time, we also acknowledge that people can feel coerced into sending and receiving these images and their experiences are entirely valid um, and that it can actually act to increase victimization. But again, the focus should maintain on the uh, perpetrator for committing those crimes. So I'm going to pass back to Craig, who's going to talk you through some of the beliefs and attitudes around um, image based sexual offending.
Thanks, Dean. That was a really nice uh, kind of overview of uh, some of the recent legislation, some of the recent work that is going on uh, in this uh, area. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, cultural beliefs and attitudes in relation to image based sexual abuse. Um, the reason I'm going to talk about this is because um, the vast majority of the work in this area so far has been conducted within sociological circles, but also in legal circles. Um, and there's an almost an assumption that underpins some of these um, these authors work um, that the motivation behind perpetrating image based sexual abuse offences is power and control and beliefs. Uh, so Claire McGlynn says that sexual offending is about power, entitlement, control, punishment and humiliation. Um, it's harmful, whether it's offline or online. And that sexual offending isn't about sexual arousal. Now, we know that this isn't strictly true when we think about any um, multifactorial model of sexual offending. We know that sexual arousal, whether that be deviant sexual interest, hypersexuality, um, sexual blockage, all form a part in the offence chain or in the trajectory into um, committing an act of sexual abuse. But if we put that to one side for a second, we also know that there are certain offence supportive cognitions that might facilitate um, a sexual offence from happening. And what the argument behind um, a lot of this work is, is that image based sexual abuse is just a, a technologically facilitated extension of this earlier work related to uh, sexual offending more broadly. Um, and the assumption here is that these beliefs are held at a societal level. Um, so many people who are watching may have heard of the term rape culture. Um, this refers to uh, the idea that as a society, we have many different beliefs about men, and women, their gender roles, about sex, about sexuality. Um, and these all come together, according to this uh, theory of rape culture, to um, encourage male sexual violence or male sexual aggression towards women. Um, and to condone physical, emotional, and we might argue sexual um, terrorism against women as being the norms. So that's a, a definition from Bookwald uh, and colleagues back in 1993. And we see this idea of rape culture being um, quite prevalent within society. So uh, at least those who advocate for this view um, suggest that there are various ways that we can observe it within society. Um, we use sexualized jokes that might incorporate sexual aggression. We say it about um, typically men being friend zoned by uh, members of the opposite sex. And the, the assumption that underpins that friend zone notion is that males are, are entitled, the default is that they're entitled to sexual access to anyone that they're interested in until such point that they become friend zoned, in which case the access is stopped. Um, we also have kind of things around uh, music and films that kind of exacerbate this idea of male sexual aggression and glorify according to this model. Um, I think most of us will remember the uh, 2014 uh, song by Robin Thicke um, with this kind of overly sexualized, sexually aggressive um, kind of connotations to it. Uh, it's called Blurred Lines. Um, but we also have uh, down the bottom left hand corner here how the culture that someone is brought up in actually dictates or has some bearing um, on how they see relations between the sexes. So you see here um, two women from, from plainly obvious, uh, obviously different culture, uh, different cultural backgrounds, um, each of which are suggesting that the other um, is being kind of dominated by male, uh, male ideals because of the way that they're dressed. So this is really showing that um, cultural identity and cultural assimilation uh, or cultural experience um, plays a, a key role in how we view sex and sexuality and gender roles. Um, now, obviously, we need to critique this idea of rape myth because of, of rape culture, sorry, um, because if we just take it as read, then we kind of we ignore the associated literature. So the, the vast majority of my own research um, looks at attitudes towards individuals with sexual convictions. Um, and it's it's inescapable that within that literature, it's it's plainly obvious that that individuals within society have incredibly negative attitudes towards individuals who commit sexual offences. Um, so this kind of goes against the idea of the fact that we have this society that glorifies male sexual violence or condones it when it happens. When actually, when we look at the uh, the attitude literature, we see widespread support for long sentences for individuals with sexual convictions. We see support for uh, even the death penalty in some cases. 
We also see calls for the extension of the sex offenders register, um, for community notification, for access to that information to be made available to the general public so that we can restrict people's access to local communities um, and to local services. Um, and in actual fact, we see relatively low levels of explicit victim blaming. So when we ask people explicitly, um, how much responsibility um, does this individual have in their victimization? Obviously, there's going to be some socially desirable responding in some of this, but this was a, a thesis that was put together um, just this past year by Jessica Eaton. Um, and what she suggested was that we live in a society that at the macro level um, has lots of victim blaming that's going on. Um, but in the widespread survey that was published within that thesis, actually there was very low rates of, of explicit victim blaming. Um, so there's a mismatch between kind of the empirical evidence in terms of objectively, what do we see in terms of how people respond to sexual crime when it does happen? And this idea of rape culture, on the other hand. Um, this isn't to say that, um, that there aren't issues with the way that people think about sex and sexuality and sexual aggression. We know that there are offence supportive beliefs um, commonly referred to as cognitive distortions or rape myths um, that do seem to facilitate sexual um, offending taking place. So these are examples of, of rape myths from the Rape Myth Acceptance Scale, uh, I think it was published by Payne and colleagues in 1999. This is the uh, Illinois scale. Um, I'm not going to read these all out to you, but what they're essentially saying is that um, there are a range of different beliefs that people might have. So whether it be related to um, a victim's past sexual behaviour or the way that they dress or um, how people view sexuality from a male's perspective. So uh, this idea of the third one down is men uh, don't usually intend to force sex on women, but sometimes they just get too sexually carried away. This idea of an uncontrollable sex drive among uh, males acts as a way to minimise and reduce the culpability of perpetrators of sexual violence. Um, and these are things that we can objectively measure. We do see quite high levels of endorsement of some of these uh, statements within the general public. Now these rape myths seem to be reflective of some underlying implicit theories. Um, so this is a, a model that was put forward by Devin Polishek and colleagues back in the early 2000s. So it's Polishek and uh, Tony Ward in 2002 and Polishek and Suzy Gannon in 2004. And what they did was they took all of the available evidence from rape myth acceptance scales and they tried to cluster them into different uh, groups of beliefs um, trying to kind of whittle all of those items down into a, a handful of uh, belief clusters that they would refer to as implicit theories. Now these are um, the idea of an implicit theory is that it guides how you make sense of the social world. You use your implicit theories to make sense of what's going on within a given situation. Um, there's five implicit theories that have been identified in relation to sexual aggression, at least adult on adult uh, sexual aggression. There are different sets of implicit theories for uh, child sexual abuse and also um, indecent images of children. But these are the ones in relation to rape. Um, the first one is related to women being unknowable. So uh, someone who in the in endorses this implicit theory would have the view that men and women are inherently different um, and they're so, uh, so for, uh, therefore, sorry, um, it's difficult for men to understand what the other uh, individual is thinking or why they are behaving in a particular way. Uh, the second implicit theory is related to women being sexual objects, um, essentially being there for uh, male sexual gratification. Um, and that is kind of supplemented almost with uh, sexual entitlement as the third implicit theory. And this is the idea that men should be entitled to sexual activity whenever they want to. Uh, the fourth implicit theory is related to that male sex drive being uncontrollable. So people will say that once a, once a, a man is, is sexually aroused, he just has to, uh, to reach uh, gratification. Uh, there's no way that he can stop or pull back that, um, that um, arousal. And the fifth one uh, is related to the dangerous world. So this is the idea that the world is um, hostile towards the individual perceiving it. Um, you typically see this one being used or uh, being endorsed in relation to uh, women being unknowable. So if the world is seen as hostile and you don't understand uh, the psychology of women, then you might infer um, malevolence in the opposite sex uh, when it's not there. So the idea here is that these implicit theories 
um, almost preempt sexual aggression. So you use these implicit theories almost to, so in relation to the dangerous world, for example, um, if the world is going to be hostile to you, then you preemptively strike um, in order to protect yourself from that dangerous world. At least that's according to uh, this model. Now, as this uh, currently stands, there is no um, standardised measure of beliefs or myths about image-based sexual abuse. There have been some attempts to uh, develop some scales, but they've typically taken things like the Illinois Rape Myth Acceptance Scale um, and substituted in uh, image-based sexual abuse or typically revenge pornography for the word rape. Um, so there's nothing that's been systematically and uh, specifically developed for image-based sexual abuse or any of the specific types of image-based sexual abuse that Dean set out at the beginning of this uh, seminar. Um, so our motivation here was to examine uh, whether or not we can test some of these ideas of implicit theories and rape myths and offence supported cognition, um, but do it in a way that is domain specific in relation to image-based sexual abuse. And we wanted to systematically test a measure of um, beliefs about image-based sexual abuse in, a stat to, in order to standardise the measurement of, uh, of this uh, cluster of beliefs. So what we've done is we've developed the uh, beliefs about revenge pornography questionnaire. This is a, a project that we've been running uh, in collaboration with Dr. Lorraine Smith, who's also a lecturer at uh, NCU, uh, and also with some of our postgraduate students over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, it started off really with us surveying the, the existing literature on rape myth acceptance and beliefs about revenge pornography, um, with the aim to develop a non-gendered, wide-ranging and standardised measure of potential beliefs and myths about uh, revenge pornography. Just to give you a flavour as to what we did to start with, was we looked at all of that literature and we picked out or what we thought we could do is we could identify a range of different domains that might underpin a particular measure. Um, the first one was related to victim blaming. Uh, so we might say something like, in the majority of revenge porn cases, the victim is promiscuous. So it's almost saying that there's some relationship between past victim behaviour and uh, their victimisation. Uh, we might also ask about victim characteristics, so it might only happen to particular types of people. Um, there might also be perpetrator characteristics in terms of are they experiencing mental health, are they uh, sexually deviant, for example. Um, and then we've got issues around the effects and uh, the context of revenge pornography. So uh, someone might be looking at or might be thinking about the motivations of revenge porn um, as being uh, related to kind of vengeance in relation to someone who's cheated on you. Um, it might be related to how they view it in terms of other sexual offences. They might start to minimise the effects of revenge pornography because they don't see it as being as bad as rape. Um, but also people might have perceptions of victim harm as well, and that could be a separate domain of interest um, that people um, are kind of uh, expressing. So what we did was we took those six domains and we just started writing a number of different items for each of them. We had uh, 91 items to, to begin with, and these were predominantly driven by our students and, uh, and Lorraine. So thank you to those uh, individuals for doing that. Um, and what we then did was we gave uh, that draft scale, along with a, range, a couple of other uh, studies, to 511 uh, participants. We recruited these from a range of different sources. So we looked at uh, Reddit, because we were trying to get a, a sample that wasn't your typical kind of university sample, but also it was more representative than the individuals who you might find on things like MTurk or Prolific. Um, so we, st we started to kind of almost spam this link on uh, social media. So we looked at sample size on Reddit, we looked at the love, the porn and the relationships board, trying to sample a cross section of uh, individuals. We also shared it on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. That's predominantly where our uh, students shared uh, the link to try and get kind of, um, it pains me to say younger people, but uh, younger people to take part in uh, the study. As I said, 511 people completed it. We had a roughly 50-50 split of males and females in the sample, which was good, with an average age of about 30 years. Um, it was an international sample, but predominantly um, with the, sort of the participants were from the uh, kind of standard Western countries, so the UK, the US, Canada, and Australia, but we do have a large sample size for testing uh, the kind of component or factor structure of the uh, BRPQ. Um, in order to look at the, the validity of the measure, we also uh, 
took measures of belief in a just world, in empathy, um, in the dark triad. Uh, so uh, things like psychopathy, narcissism and Machiavellianism, uh, sadism and also uh, rape myth acceptance. So we wanted to see whether or not there was any overlap between how people view rape and how people view revenge pornography. We also then wanted to look at uh, kind of whether the BRPQ, if we could develop a, a measure that made sense, if it predicted anything, um, anything meaningful. So we were looking at judgments of revenge pornography cases. So we would give people um, a case of revenge porn to judge. And then we would also uh, it basically get them to imagine that they've committed an act of revenge porn um, and see whether or not they would uh, support doing that uh, or engaging in that, in that behavior. OK, so what did we find? We first did a, a parallel analysis and this essentially looks at how many factors statistically are underpinning uh, the, the scale that you've developed. That indicated four factors or four components. Uh, so we ran a principal components analysis to extract those four factors. Um, but the fourth factor was essentially uh, two items, each of which were contradictory to each other. So that wasn't really telling us much. We dropped that and settled on this three factor uh, solution. Um, the first factor is related to being, victims being responsible. So this is your standard victim blaming uh, component. An example item is only promiscuous individuals are uh, victims of revenge porn. That was a really reliable, um, reliable factor. The second cluster um, that we identified was related to beliefs about the motivations of uh, the perpetrators of revenge pornography. Um, so this is looking at uh, things around power and control. So the predominant theme of this uh, cluster of items was about power and control. So we labelled this sociological explanations of revenge pornography. Um, so, for example, a revenge pornography uh, case is an expression of uncontrolled desire to assert power. If you endorse that claim, then you score higher on the sociological explanation of revenge porn. Uh, the final factor uh, was related to how whether they see revenge pornography as a sexual offence. So someone might say uh, that it's not as bad to be a victim of revenge porn than it is to be raped. Um, now, taking apart, kind of putting to one side whether we agree with that or not, um, it does give us an indication as to where someone puts or where someone places revenge pornography, potentially within a continuum of sexual abuse more generally. I know Dean spoke about the continuum of image-based sexual abuse, um, but people may have an implicit um, continuum of how harmful different sexual offences are. Um, this final uh, final factor helps us to identify where revenge pornography is placed along that continuum for uh, anyone taking part in this uh, or completing the scale. Now, I know there's a lot of numbers on this uh, on this screen, so I'm just going to hide the top part because really what we're interested in is uh, the relationships between the three factors that we've developed and um, other relevant constructs. So those constructs related to uh, politics and sex and the psychological issues or the psychological constructs that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, if we just work across, um, I'm hoping you can see my uh, my mouse cursor. Um, but you see here that believing that victims are responsible um, is associated with uh, male sex. So men are more likely to see victims as responsible than uh, women. Um, it's also associated with politics. So that's a conservative political or orientation. So people who are more politically conservative are more likely to see victims as being responsible. Um, the less uh, empathic you are, the less empathy you have, uh, the more likely you are to see victims as being responsible. The more you believe that the world is just, the more likely you are to see victims as being responsible. And then the more rape myths and the more dark personality traits that you have, the more likely you are to see victims as being responsible. And this, these relationships make sense and we were expecting them, but it's nice to see that the, the scale that we've developed actually reflects those relationships. Similarly, we see uh, essentially for, for the, the other two factors, we see the opposite trends. So uh, you see negative relationships here between uh, sadism and Machiavellianism and uh, the belief in revenge porn being a sexual offence. So what you're seeing here is that the more people see um, revenge porn as being a sexual offence, the less sadistic they are. So they're em empathising more with the victims of uh, revenge pornography um, offences. 
The interesting thing for us though was, um, can these factors predict anything? Um, so we first off looked at victim blame. So we gave people a, a scenario that involved a revenge porn case, and we were looking at how much do they blame the victim, how much do they see that as, an, as a criminal offence, and also um, how much harm do they perceive the victim to have experienced. Um, when we looked at the predictive uh, factors or the predictive values of these, uh, you blamed the victim more if you have less empathy. That's the first uh, significant result on this table. Uh, the more sadistic you were, the more you blamed the victim. And also the more you see victims as being responsible, the more you blame the victim. So again, we have this uh, lining up of explicitly blaming the victim and seeing revenge pornography victims in a general sense as being responsible for their victimization. In terms of criminality, uh, we also see that uh, believing that victims of revenge porn are uh, responsible for their offences um, predicts lower levels of criminality uh, judgment. So the more you see them as responsible, the less criminal you see that case as being. Um, the result that we really have no idea how to interpret is this bottom one here. So uh, the idea here is that the more you see revenge pornography as a sexual offence, the more likely you are to uh, to say it's being criminal. Actually, that one makes sense. It's the, uh, the ones further on that doesn't make sense. Uh, so that does make sense, sorry. Uh, in terms of victim harm, uh, we see that belief in a just world, if you have higher levels of belief in a just world, you, you perceive uh, victims of revenge pornography as experiencing less harm. Um, and similarly, if you see uh, revenge pornography victims as being responsible, you perceive them as having less harm or experiencing less harm as a result of their victimization. So again, what we've got here is a collection of um, beliefs that seem to be predicting in the expected directions um, people's judgments about revenge pornography offending. Uh, these are also explaining a, a substantial proportion of the variance in each of our um, outcomes. We're not going to stress this too much, but between a quarter and uh, just over a third of the variance in judgments about revenge pornography were explained by these models. Looking at proclivity then, so proclivity relates to how likely you are to actually engage in a particular behaviour. Um, we measured this in three ways. So we first off gave um, individuals who were taking this survey um, a scenario where we essentially were saying you have done this, um, you've engaged in this behaviour which is a revenge porn offence uh, without naming it as a revenge porn offence. Uh, we had three clusters of questions. The first one was related to whether they would do it, so explicitly asking them would you engage in this behaviour. The second cluster of questions was related to their enjoyment or their perceived enjoyment of doing that behaviour and engaging in that behaviour. And the third cluster of questions was related to uh, whether they would expect approval for engaging in that behaviour. Um, what we found was that people who were higher in Machiavellianism, so this is around kind of manipulativeness, um, were less likely to say that they would engage in, uh, in revenge pornography offending. That could be uh, related to uh, maybe socially, uh, socially desirable responding. So if people are more manipulative, then they may be under-reporting uh, their actual proclivity towards revenge pornography. Um, but what we see here is that people who blame victims more would be more likely to engage in the behaviour. People who endorse sociological explanations of revenge porn are also more likely to engage in the behaviour. Um, that might be related to the fact that they're endorsing sociological rather than sexual motivations and that might be because they don't want to be seen as being sexually deviant. Um, and this is the one that doesn't make sense. So the, uh, the more someone sees uh, revenge pornography as a sexual offence, the more likely they are to self-report having some interest in engaging in that behaviour. Now that to us didn't make any sense. Um, it still doesn't. So if you do have any interpretation of that, um, please either put it in the Q&A and we can pick that up or um, drop us an email um, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about what that might mean. In terms of enjoyment perceptions, people who were more empathic uh, reported less uh, or lower propensity to enjoy engaging in revenge pornography. Uh, people who are more sadistic said that they would probably enjoy engaging in that behaviour um, and people who see victims as responsible and endorse these power based motivations were also likely to say that they would enjoy engaging in revenge pornography. 
And when we look at people's um, perceptions of whether they would be approved for um, for this, the more likely uh, or the, the more that an individual um, has empathy or has, is empathic, the less likely they would be to um, to perceive that they would be uh, approved for what they were doing. Um, the more people saw victims as being responsible, the less likely it would be that they would be um, condoned or approved for that. Um, and also the more that they endorsed endorse the idea that revenge pornography is a sexual offence, the less likely they would be to perceive being approved. So again, you've got this idea of um, if people are seeing revenge pornography as a sexual offence, we know that sexual offending is stigmatised, so therefore you would expect less approval. And again, substantial proportions of uh, the variance in each of those outcomes being explained um, between kind of a quarter to a third of uh, the variance being explained. OK, so just before I hand back to, uh, to Dean, um, we have some conclusions. So we do think that the BRPQ, this cluster of beliefs about revenge pornography, um, does seem to be a valid and reliable measure of social beliefs about revenge pornography. Um, we will stress that this isn't a myth scale. This isn't developed as in line with the rape myth literature. Um, it can be seen as being kind of in, in line with that, in tandem, will you being used in tandem with that um, because of the kind of overlap between rape myth and uh, beliefs about revenge pornography. But obviously we don't know that some things are myths and also it's, uh, it's not necessarily the case that if someone endorses a sociological view of, of revenge pornography that we can realistically call that a myth. Um, and it does seem to be associated with um, with meaningful outcomes that are related to revenge pornography offending. So things like judgments and proclivity to actually engage in that behaviour, um, which would be in line with uh, the kind of rest of the literature in the, in the area of sexual offending. So I am going to now hand back over to Dean, who's going to take you through another uh, set of studies that we've been running, uh, looking at judgments of deep fake pornography production. Hey guys, so um, as always, Craig and I um, can say very little in a lot of time. And so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time kind of going through some of the kind of niche aspects um, because this is work which is currently being kind of written up and hopefully will be disseminated um, ASAP. So if we move on to kind of the, the, the next slide, which talks about one of our um, studies into uh, deepfake media production. Now, this study is kind of being led by um, our master students who's based at Derby, but she's an online student, so isn't based in Derby, um, who is at Yairo. Uh, very, very proud of her. She's done some fantastic work and the work's being submitted soon, I think. Um, so marking time for me. Um, and essentially this work um, aimed to explore a judgment of uh, deep faking as a function of sex and status of that individual. So whether or not they were a celebrity. We had a very large kind of cohort of UK based participants and we wanted to kind of base those participants in the UK as a very kind of strong starting point uh, as we can move on further into the West and the East. And we included several measures such as proclivity, our beliefs in revenge porn scale, uh, rate of acceptance scale and also some of those aspects of dark triad which Craig uh, spoke about. We also faced our participants uh, with a vignette which gave a scenario of how deep faking could take place. So for example we had individuals, uh, Taylor and Ashley, um, who kind of acted as adult males or females. So we used the names kind of interchangeably and they were either a barista at their local uh, coffee shop or they were a celebrity um, who I believe was a singer and a actor. And essentially we gave a scenario where um, an individual tried to strike up a, a physical relationship. They weren't able to do that. And so they generated these images and disseminated them. And our results were very interesting. So if we pop on to uh, the next slide, the results are kind of threefold. So first of all, on the graph on the left, we see that when we ask people about their judgments of these offences, the judgments were more punitive, OK, when the individual was a female, and when that individual was a, a non-celebrity. OK, so in essence, people cared more about the victim. OK, when that individual was somebody who could be anyone in the general population 
um, and who was a female. When that individual was a celebrity, people kind of cared less. I kind of guess we could link into that kind of victim blaming literature, you know, um, well, their, their images are out there. Of course, they would expect their images to be kind of manipulated in this fashion. And also people cared more um, when, or what people cared less when it was a male, probably um, linking in, and I say probably because we don't actually know, but this is one way could, we could explain these results, linking in with the fact that men are more likely to send more images. So perhaps they don't care if their images get manipulated one way or another. Um, of importance, and this is something which we kind of touch upon in the book, uh, which is from Delfino's work of last year, is that when we talk about victims of deep fake pornography, we always think about the image, the images of the people's faces who get superimposed. We never take time to consider the bodies of the individuals whose faces were superimposed onto. So that's a very niche area of research in itself. Um, we also took these 800 people and without naming deep faking throughout the entire study, we asked them to name what kind of offence it was. And um, we was very kind of liberal, very kind of liberal in, in terms of kind of giving them points for naming it. You know, we go for deep faking, deep fake porn, deep porn, uh, likeness porn, morph porn, anything of that nature. But we found that only 4% of our um, sample could actually name the offence. And if we're looking at kind of moving this to become criminalized, it's very important that the public actually can name and can state and can describe what these offenses are and how they look. And finally, we asked some proclivity questions again, like what Craig was talking about in terms of would you do it? OK, would you make these images? Would you disseminate these images? And we found that in both cases, psychopathy was positively associated with your ability to do that. So that could be this kind of deviousness that people with high levels of psychopathic traits in the general population have, um, or it could be a kind of comorbidity with a lack of empathy. So of course I'm going to do it because I don't care what the victim does or what the victim says or what happens to the victim in the end. And Craig and I with a different student have just identified, um, we've just collected data on whether or not this dissemination, so whether or not it matters if people just make the images or whether they share the images, whether that kind of changes people's opinions. And that's data which we're hoping to kind of take a look at in the next week or so. Um, yeah, so kind of just to kind of wrap up uh, the final section before we take any questions. I know lots of you have been kind of asking questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, make sure to get those in and we'll try and address them. Is kind of our future directions of where we want to take this work. And I kind of guess we're opening this up to, to you guys. If you want to collaborate with us, make sure to get in touch with us, email, Twitter. Um, and some of this work I've actually um, tried to start to do uh, this year. So I made some connections with uh, collaborators in uh, Brazil, uh, Valesca Guerrera and Ariela uh, Sagrila. Butchered those names, of course I have. Um, and essentially what we want to do is look at cross-cultural comparisons, okay? So culture plays a drastic role in how we kind of see and believe things and our attitudes towards them. And it must be said that much of our knowledge comes from the kind of um, Western kind of modern ideologicalized countries. Um, we don't know the roles that gender plays, okay? And um, the perceptions about gender, they vary across cultures. So how might that impact somebody's perception of these offences or these offence types? And also I was talking with a University of Derby online student who was based in Saudi Arabia, and they actually said that as a victim, if they had their images shared by an offender, it would be them that actually got in trouble. And that's actually another point of kind of contention and thought that we as researchers in a kind of diverse world need to be contemplating to make sure that our results are as applicable and as widespread as humanly possible. Um, and also kind of beliefs and views about sex and sex related crimes. We know that these are entwined with religion and familiar values. So it's about how we can kind of tease those aspects apart. So the second of the future directions that we kind of want to go down is that of trying to model this offending behavior. Now, lots of kind of modeling comes from the biopsychosocial model, which without having gone into too much detail, looks at how our psychological personality traits, uh, the impact of our social situations, these cultural values, these friendship groups, these families, 
all entwined with biological mechanisms, okay? So sort of innate predispositions that lead us to behaving in a certain way. And that's something which I think has got a lot of weight. It's something which has been highly looked at in the offending literature and also the sex offending literature. And I think it's something that we could not easily, but possibly map on to the image-based sexual offending. And then the penultimate uh, future direction that we want to take here is for us to have a look at some of the kind of limitations and the barriers which stop people from getting treatment and stop people from reaching out and getting help from other individuals. Okay, so at the minute you've got Safeline, you've got the Revenge Porn Helpline, but we know that people, because of X, Y, and Z, are fearful about reaching out and getting help. They could be suffering from repeat victimization. They could worry about what happens in the criminal justice system once they are in it. So we already showed that only 17 of those cases in Israel actually went to court and actually got the conviction. OK, so individuals past experiences with the criminal justice system, how can we ease and smooth that to make their accessibilities of treatment and support? How can we ease that and kind of proliferate what these individuals actually need and also do that with a supporting family and friendship network whereby otherwise they may not be believed? And finally, we look to the world of education. And this is why uh, right at the start I talked about in the kind of uh, so if we could pop onto the next slide. Yeah, so. Um, Right, right at the start, I talked about how much of our focus is going to be on adults, but we know that this sexting behaviour actually occurs in quite young school ages as well. And there's a kind of a newspaper clipping here, uh, which I've cited, whereby a 14 year old boy became uh, the youngest person in Britain to be convicted of revenge pornography offences. Now, um, those without going into too much detail, because that's a whole lecture in itself, um, those of you know about the dissemination of child abuse images, OK, know that actually these individuals who are receiving and disseminating these revenge porn images as children are actually disseminating child abuse imagery. And so the sanctions for these individuals, even though they are younger than adults, um, could have grave implications, not just kind of legally at this situation, but also how their future pans out after that offence. And so we're working with uh, Dr. Dominic Petronzi at the University of Derby to help develop um, educational programmes that we can reach out to parents, teachers and children to really instil in them the importance. And that's something that if successful in the UK, we also want to take international. So I'm going to wrap up my section and pass back to Craig, who's going to kind of wrap us up uh, completely. And hopefully we can look at those questions if anyone submitted any. I just unmute myself, that's good. Um, yeah, I think we're getting to the point now where um, we are thinking about questions that we've got. And I've seen a few come in already. Um, the slides are available. That was one of the questions that came through. Uh, so the slides are available on the Open Science Framework. Um, if you just go to the, uh, the web page that's on the slide here um, and find the NCU Seminar 2020 Image-Based Sexual Abuse uh, file, that's the slides for uh, for today's uh, seminar. Um, obviously, Dean and myself are available via email, so if you've got any questions after uh, the seminar or if you're watching this after the seminar on, uh, online, then do just drop us an email if you've got questions. Um, and as we've already kind of said, we do have a book that's coming out um, later this year. Uh, we don't have the publication date yet, uh, but we're due to submit the manuscript uh, next week, this week, I think. Um, so yeah, that's coming out soon um, as well. So there is more information uh, due to be uh, published any time now. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the end of, of our stuff. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and we'll uh, move on to some uh, questions now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put up uh, just a single screen with uh, that slide because it's easier than going backwards and forwards between uh, the two of us. Um, so if Dean, if you want to, um, to answer a question, just kind of let me know and I can put you on the screen as well. Yeah, of course. Um, OK, so looking at the questions that have been published, published so far, um, we've got one that says, is there anything, any information about perceptions of abuse against fully gen computer generated images? Uh, people understand this as being different relationship 
to images based on film or photography. So we're looking here at uh, a potential difference between uh, computer generated images and uh, images of real individuals. I'm not aware of any literature at the moment about that. Um, Dean, I don't know if you are. No, not at all. That's, that, that's actually a fantastic question. Yeah, I mean, uh, so that's come from from Andrew Grace there. If you if you do want to drop us an email, we'd be more than happy to discuss that as a as a potential option to to look at. Um, someone has said, uh, would it be fair to suggest that individuals uh, will give socially desirable response to rape offences publicly, but their internal thoughts uh, and views of this, which may share uh, with like minded people, are actually good, uh, condoning of rape? Uh, Yes, so I'm just going to uh, come back on for that. So yes, that is potential, uh, potentially the case. Um, what I would say is that that would be corresponding almost perfectly with the implicit theory uh, literature. So the idea that people hold implicitly a particular belief about sex or sexuality, um, that might be their instinctual um, response, that might be their automatic response, um, but at the same time they wouldn't necessarily express that um, publicly. So they would inhibit that internal response and then uh, potentially overcome that and give a socially desirable response instead. Um, looking at the other questions, um, have you considered any qualitative research um, to get detailed perspectives of these kinds of offences? Uh, Dean, have you got anything in the pipeline for qualitative research? So not in terms of, well, so, so, so we are asking about people's um, perceptions, but only kind of um, one off kind of sentence indicators. Um, I think that it is work that needs to be done. Um, Hall and Hearn in their book, so that's, that's Matthew, Hall and, uh, Matthew Hall and Jeff Hearn, um, their book that came out on the same topic last year, um, they had interviews of, um, or, well, they had interviews and also transcripts from people who originally posted on isanyoneup.com. And that was actually really interesting in terms of why people were doing things. So that would be a great starting point. Um, I've actually, actually, I've got, got it here. It's like on the side of my desk. So yeah, awesome book. Um, I will put a link to that actually in chat as well. So yeah. I think actually there, there must be some research in the sexting literature um, around perceptions of revenge porn or experiences of, uh, of being victimised in that particular way. Um, I know there's been some small scale research done at NCU um, in relation to some of our MSc forensic psychology students who have done uh, stuff around experiences of sexting and I think revenge porn has come up in there. I don't know exactly what that literature or what those findings said though. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the other questions. Um, somebody has said, uh, so I'm currently carrying out research into sex robots. And one of the questions uh, is about the acceptable of making them with a likeness of uh, celebrities. That is a really interesting um, area of research. So another kind of strand of my research is looking at uh, perceptions of sex doll use or sex doll ownership. Um, and kind of aligned with that is the idea of sex robot ownership as well. Um, if you want to drop me an email, I'd be more than happy to uh, share some stuff. We actually have uh, some myself and uh, Rebecca Leavesley have a, a review paper that is about to come out anytime now, looking at motivations and judgments of uh, individuals who own sex dolls and sex robots. So that would be an, a really interesting uh, topic of conversation. I don't know at the moment, again, going back to the computer generated versus real images, I'm not aware of any literature that suggests any difference or any similarities actually in terms of the judgments of uh, dolls that look like celebrities versus those that just look like um, just look like dolls. Um, have we found any differences in male and female perpetrators of image based sexual abuse? Uh, Dean, do you want to come in on that one? Yes, so that's kind of um, that's kind of very much related to Hall and Hearn's uh, work once again. Um, I think typically 
the motivate if, if memory serves and this is where i'm going to trip up and if, if either of them are in the chat um i apologize for butchering your work and please do step in um but i believe that kind of the motivations were similar and a lot of it was kind of feeding into this sort of area of revenge and this is why we're doing it we've been spurned lovers um etc one of the kind of key differences that so one thing that we haven't really touched on is that majority of our research my man and craig's at the minute is coming from individuals who are heterosexual now hall and hearn touched on non-heterosexual um offenders as well and some of their kind of things about um females was that they didn't see the their ex-female partner as being a proper or true lesbian and i think there was actually a term coined within that book which i can't remember which i actually felt was extraordinary because i never felt the the depth before so i i would assume that yes there are differences but again this is a very sort of emerging and growing topic and it is something that um, we should explore especially because we do know that males and females tend to use um social media for slightly different um aspects and also aggression manifests differently in males and females psychopathy manifests differently in males and females and so it's in all likelihood we will see that the offenders of image-based sexual abuse and also splitting the offense topics by themselves and not treating it as an umbrella um also there will be slight um differences there as well uh just grabbing uh yaya's question and I don't know if this is my Yaya or a different Yaya, um, as in Ray or the student. Um, have you thought about exploring the image-based sexual abuse aimed at people with non-conventional sexual orientation? So, so yes, that very much kind of maps onto that. And I think, yes, we do need to do that. Um, but what Craig and I tried to do, I guess, was to try and, rightly or wrongly, um, make it easier for ourselves, um, go with the kind of social norm, but actually we are in a world now where that the social norm might not be the wider social norm and it is something that we do need to address. And yes, with time that work will come and we will prioritise it. Okay, uh, Dean, while you're still on the, uh, on the screen, we've got a question about uh, kind of hidden cameras in bathroom stalls. Uh, yes, I, I saw uh, that. Widespread. Would that be voyeurism? So I, th I think I think that is classed as voyeurism, right? It's slightly different from upskirting. Um, but I, I was actually going to put that back to you to see whether there's actually a particular sort of um, sex-related deviancy around that, whether that's got an actual name or, I mean, it, it probably has got an actual name, right? Uh, I'm not sure actually. I'm not sure if that that specifically has a, a name. I'm sure that there will be a a, a philia that goes along with that. Um, I'm not 100% sure to be honest. Um, my perception would be that that would that would fit the criteria for voyeurism, though, uh, given that it's taking the uh, taking a sexual image in a scenario where uh, the victim would not be expecting that image to be to be taken. Exactly. Um, and what else have we, have we have we missed anything that's that's kind of key sticking out here? Um, oh, uh, so so from Natasha, would would this research be used to inform the education sector on how to inform and teach younger generation? And I I would hope so. Like when when Craig and I conduct any sort of research, the aim of that research is to have some sort of impact and, to, and we don't just want to research and stick all of our findings in an academic journal which only people in kind of a ivory tower that have the money and the abilities to access those journals can okay we make sure that all of our research is open access so that anyone can kind of grab it and use it and the part of that is it being applicable and I think the education sector is somewhere that's needed and when we kind of invited Dominic Petronzi from Derby onto the project he was very excited because it's it's things that he's seen he's seen this rise in sexting which as we know is a normal way of developing kind of um relationships you know even even if that is as a teenager but as soon as you're putting this forensic lens on it um it does become important and it is education that we need to teach not just the teachers not just the students but also the parents as well to have this kind of more holistic and engaged kind of face on things so yeah, that's that's uh, that's really key. Um, we there's also a few questions about the slides, um, so we can definitely uh, put those up. And I think we've got a 
do we have a list of emails as well that we can ping the slides out to? I don't, I don't know if that's kind of GDPR compliant anymore. Um, but I've, I have put the link in the, um, I have put the link in the chat a few times as well. And we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll also tweet that out as well later today. Yeah, and we can share it when we post this um, recording online. We can share, um, we can share the slides there as well. Awesome. Um, did we get to, did we get to Kim's question? About I don't think no. Um, so about the scale, will this be made public at some point? Uh, yes, it will. Um, so we are currently uh, writing that up with uh, with Lorraine Smith um, and a couple of our uh, students. We're writing that paper up for publication. As soon as we have that ready, um, it will be submitted as a preprint online and we will make that available on uh, Twitter as well. So yes, all of the research that we're doing, um, kind of another one of our kind of um, interest, I suppose, is around the open science movement. So everything that we're doing, we're trying to make open access as much as possible. And there was also a follow up questions of how, how do we fight victim blaming? Um, like if, if you if you look at Jess Eaton's book, um, rightly or wrongly, that it is it's prevalent in our society and it is something which we do need to engage in that discourse and potentially tackle from a more kind of holistic view. Um, it's something which isn't going to be a quick fix. It's something that everybody needs to be getting involved in and it's kind of almost normalizing the discussion around being a victim of revenge porn and at some point stopping using the words revenge porn. I mean, Craig and I have both used it throughout this seminar, but just as a kind of accessibility issue, um, but it is important. And how do we start a conversation about these issues? Wow. Yeah. I mean, how, how do we start conversations? Chatting to family, friends, start at very low levels and trying to widen that sphere, I guess. Um, but it is something which potentially needs to be done from a governmental level as well. Um, educational level, social scientist level. Um, but yes, I do not have a clear answer for that and I just wish it will come in a timely fashion. Um, yeah. An anonymous question at the bottom um, as well. Um, did the uh, did the research suggest how prevalent victim blaming was for revenge porn IBSA? Um, there is kind of prevalence in terms of sexting, but we are looking at a lot higher than we would imagine. OK, and one of the important considerations to make is that we don't always um, we don't always know that we are victims of these offences. So we talked about upskirting offences, whereby the whole point of it is to covertly take these images and share them or keep them or upload them. Um, in terms of revenge porn, like unless you're unless somebody actively sends you that image says, oh, look, you're, you've been featured on this website or it's been sent around the social circle, um, you could live your life without knowing that your images have been disseminated. OK, um, it still makes you a victim, but obviously, I guess what's worse, knowing that you're a victim or not knowing that you're a victim is a, it's a real kind of contingency. Um, but yeah, no, like if you if you kind of ask people like have you ever sent a picture or have you ever shown a picture of an, of an ex or a current girlfriend to your friends? I think the answer would be a lot higher than people would imagine. And, and that's why we need to stop using the term revenge pornography because it, it does just suggest that we're uploading these images to dedicated revenge porn or porn sites when actually it can just be the act of sharing between friends and social circles, which in itself is extremely uh, detrimental. Cool. Um, lots of other questions as well. So uh, Craig and I are kind of happy to uh, carry on. Um, I, I kind of guess if there are any people that do need to go, thank you very much for um, having attended the session. And I, I'm sure I'll speak on Craig's behalf as well. There as well. And anyone from Trent, thank you very much for inviting me back. I, even though it's not in the building, um, I have loved coming back. But I think um, Craig and I will carry on answering some questions if everyone's sticking around. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um... I see that there is this one question about um, so when I was talking about rape culture at the beginning, um, I referred to the research that I've been doing on individuals with sexual convictions being kind of a, a, a kind of benchmark for that or a baseline for that. Um, one of the questions that has been uh, posed is about whether or not that might be skewed by the label itself of, of individuals with sexual convictions or in that literature, um, a lot of the questionnaires are focused around 
the label of sex offenders um, and whether that might be skewed by people's perceptions of what or who those people are. Um, absolutely, yes, it could be. Um, we've done a lot of research there. My, my entire PhD thesis was on how do people construct or understand that label of sex offender? Um, but yes, they do seem to have um, a particular schema in mind when people are thinking about a sex offender or someone who has sexual convictions as the label um, is now looking in the, in the literature. Um, and that does seem to be this kind of, uh, if we borrow King and Roberts work, um, this idea of a predatory male paedophile. So yes, uh, it could be to do with that. Um, so it might not necessarily apply perfectly to the image-based sexual abuse literature, but what that literature does suggest is that we do not live in a society that condones male sexual violence. Um, and I think that was the key behind uh, what I was trying to say in that section. To do, um, I'm writing up my MA thesis on image-based sexual abuse and I found that previous victimisation in image-based sexual abuse was strongly correlated with predicted image-based sexual abuse perpetration and vice versa. Could it be that one barrier is people being afraid to get in trouble themselves? Um, yes, I, I would say that's very much that's very much a possibility. It's it's, it's, a, it's a weird one because without that kind of qualitative additional kind of focus, we don't actually know why people are taking part in this activity. And we were talking actually with um, Simon Duff from uh, the University of Nottingham. And one of the kind of issues in their research is that when they're actually talking to individuals in forensic settings, it's always so ad hoc in terms of the rationale for why they're engaging in certain behaviour um, that, that they actually are. And so, yes, we kind of need to know people's reasons before they commit the offence or after they commit the offence, but before they get caught to get a true rationale of why. And that is really difficult to do, really difficult to do. Um, somebody, in, somebody in chat telling me that, um, that the term for the, the term for the proper lesbians, and I, I obviously you can't see the quotations because I'm not on the screen, but I, I'm very much indicating quotations. Um, was being a gold star lesbian. So yes, and one of the reasons for sharing your ex. Uh, lesbian partners images is because they aren't a proper gold star lesbians quotations again all over the place so yes uh, thank you very much for for correcting me with that um oh uh simon there as well actually in, re in relation to male female differences one suggestion is that males use images for sexual purposes females for affiliation as an example uh, there's a case where two women were vying for the approval of a man by sending um consensual sexual csa images sorry um however we need to be cautious as there are different levels of legitimacy taking having pictures at different levels of access 100 percent simon um again it's about it's about teasing that apart right it's about so much of craig and my research at the at the minute is looking at these more kind of holistic values and holistic perceptions and holistic attitudes but actually um true research would be to delve deeper and tease these apart and really get to the core meaning and the rationale of why people are doing what they're doing and the kind of suggestion that you've had there and i'm just going to publish that so everyone else can see it is um is a very good kind of example of why we need to do that but again as, as kind of our previous conversations in the past very difficult to to do um anonymous a friend of mine was the victim of deep fake media production involving her and an underage child. This was done by teenage boys. The police did not pursue it and she was told boys will be boys. It's only a bit of fun. Um, exactly, exactly. How harrowing and like if, if you if you say that to somebody in the general population, they are disgusted at that um, and they they would assume that this is actually a criminal offence. OK, and that's why we need a swift move for criminalisation against it. But at the same time, we need to be mindful. And, and I think this is where Claire McGlynn's work in driving legislation and law around uh, revenge pornography is key in that they're trying to do this in a more holistic fashion that covers everything. OK, and I think there are going to be kind of niche psychological differences in terms of why people do what they do. Um, but that shouldn't stop something from being a law. 
And I th think Craig and I have talked in the past how we do need to marriage legal literature and psychological social science literature. It's not always easy and sometimes one stops the other. Um, but yeah, no, that's a that's a very kind of terrible story to hear. And obviously thoughts go out to your friend there. Um, and then just the last one, please let me know if I've missed any. Um, I recently completed a PhD in the risk assessment of sexual offenders, particularly image based offenders. Have you looked at the risk element of this? I found this is a lack of research on this particular for risk. Uh, we haven't. Um, I don't know if Craig knows of any, um, but if we could have a quick peek at your PhD, I'm sure we'd both be very interested in reading it and hopefully there might be some collabs that can be done further down the line. Uh, it's great that like someone's looking into that. Craig's obviously got his mic muted. Yeah, obviously. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I think another one of the comments that we haven't uh, got to, or one of the questions we haven't got to is around kind of the treatment of perpetrators. Um, and we don't know at the moment how that might work, um, mainly because we don't have a big enough sample of perpetrators to, to sample. Um, so that's maybe where some of the qualitative work might come in, uh, looking at people's motivations, looking at how that maps onto existing sex offender literature, looking at uh, kind of trajectories into image based sexual abuse offending, um, looking at risk factors, looking at treatment factors and things like that. So, yes, um, do drop us a line, send us your thesis. Uh, we would be more than happy to, to have a look and have a chat about collaborations. And um... Mm -mm. In Japan, they have made the sound of a camera click on iPhones impossible to disable by the phone operators. That's how bad upskirting is there. Interesting. I mean, that uh, it, it, was, it was like what I noted about earlier in terms of you need to work with developers of apps in order to put in or restrict, <clears throat> sorry, uh, functionality when we are talking about these offences. And that's a very extreme way of doing it. But actually, I guess it could be a very kind of efficient way of doing it. Um, I'm curious about the idea of rape culture not being supported by attitudes towards those convicted of sex crimes. What about people who have been taken to court for rape and not convicted, but have clearly not behaved well when guilty of rape, e.g. Uh, Belfast rugby trial? Um, I'm not familiar myself, Craig might be. Uh, there can be very strong opinions that if not found guilty, they must be innocent by some and guilty by others. If, I'm curious if you've seen how that fits with attitudes towards those convicted. Mm, no, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not data that we currently have. I don't believe. No, um, and I, I totally get that point. I'm not aware of that case, that specific case either. Um, but yes, it's true that uh, we do have very low conviction rates uh, for rape, um, and that is often used as evidence for the fact that we have a rape culture. Um, my personal view, and again, I don't have any stats at the moment to back this up, um, as of right now. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily suggest that that is symptomatic of, of rape culture. I would probably say that it's more related to the fact that these cases typically are incredibly difficult to prosecute. Um, often it comes down to uh, one party's uh, word against another, which is in, inherently quite difficult to, uh, to, to prove an offence has taken place. And that might be why you have those low levels of, of convictions, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm conscious that I missed, um, I think I missed Ian's note in the chat, which I can't find now. Oh, yeah. Um, is that is that not the same as committing any regular crime, deviant or regular, in regards to knowing and expecting to have punishment if caught? Yes. Um, and that's why in, in a lot of kind of, you know, in a lot of research, we, 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 we tend to use, use the, I mean, rightly or wrongly, again, we, we say, if you had 0% chance of getting caught, uh, what would you do or how would you feel? It's just one avenue of kind of trying to tap into that. Whether it's kind of um, faultless is an area of debate, um, but it's one kind of research method that we can use to, to try and try and achieve that. Uh, but, but, but yes, it's, it's definitely not faultless. Um, Anonymous, have you considered the case of people sharing sexting conversations without consent? And yes, like we would probably argue that actually that very much kind of falls into the remit, OK, because you've got people who are sharing private, intimate details and which can actually um, map onto exactly the same victimization, the same impact of them um, as a function of their images being shared. 
maybe not as pervasively, but it's still it, it's still a thing. And so um, that's another area of research in itself. I mean, it's a very quick and easy paper that we can we can do. Uh, yes, thank you for that suggestion. And Yaya, um, in my thesis on deep fake pornography offence judgments, the emerging theme was sexual double standards rooted in traditional society. It's a mammoth challenge to mindset of the people, uh, but it is uh, need of the hour. Yes. Um, and, and you can imagine, right, you, you can imagine that there is that kind of sexual double standard that is kind of mapped into society. And that's why we've kind of hopefully we've indicated across this whole presentation that there is a distinct need for um, for us to appreciate culture and to well, not even to appreciate it, but to understand it from the forefront about how that is impacting our day to day judgments and beliefs. Uh, it's not just limited to um, sex offending or pornography offences. It's it's kind of vast to that. It's, it's associated with our day to day lives. Um, can you please tell how we can differentiate between marital forced sexual abuse from extreme sex that later leads to sexual abuse? Legally, what can be done? How can the victim best be helped to cope? That falls better in Craig's remit, and I know I'm putting him on the spot um, as he smirks in the background. Um, I don't know if you've got any kind of thoughts on that, Craig? Uh, no, not really. Um, the, it's, a, it's a really big kind of issue, uh, but no, it's not something that I've specifically done work on. So. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to kind of speculate on that kind of thing. I think it's maybe too big a topic to, to speculate on. OK, so there is um, there's Imogen. Um, with there being a, a proportion of young people perpetuating IBSA, so Hackett and colleagues have looked into this 100 percent great work. Um, and I think conversations around appropriate education in school and the home is important as a method of prevention. Uh, complemented by the appropriate treatment post conviction happy to share reading recommendations yes please um please drop us those emails that would be greatly appreciated like we, we do try to cover as much as we can but obviously there are going to be loopholes and holes in the work um do you think there is a difference in rape culture beliefs in the general public and the criminal lawyers judges now that is really interesting i'm assuming there is literature on that somewhere um i don't know it to hand but um like you you oftentimes see on social media that certain judges and certain people it, that are higher up have said kind of risque things that maybe certain academics and, and members of the public don't agree with and so yeah I, I very much kind of um feel that there would be a slight difference there although i don't know which direction that would be i'm i'm not sure there is actually that literature available um i i mean there must be something somewhere maybe in the legal literature but i'm not aware of anything off the top of my head um, however, that would be a really interesting uh, study to run, particularly in light of uh, the new beliefs in revenge porn uh, questionnaire. Uh, that would be a really nice uh, study for us to run to see whether or not there are differences in the legislature uh, or among lawyers than uh, there are in the general public. And, and, and that's actually something which has been done in the psychopathy literature. So there are um, research in psychopathy that have looked into kind of different perceptions in the general public and the court system. So it's kind of a it's kind of just a one for one trade off study. It's something that would be fairly easy if we had the access to run. So if anyone's still in the chat that has that access, let us know. And uh, Franzi, in the beginning, you showed only 17 perpetrators. So that was in the uh, Israel at the time that that study came out. Sorry, just, just a caveat. Uh, do you know anything about the reasons for why others were not? So it was the it was purely in terms of who do we convict? OK, so I, I, I think if I remember right reading that paper, the majority of those cases were the fact that either the complaints were withdrawn or the fact that they couldn't identify the particular perpetrator because of the dissemination was so wide. So, for example, um, if one image was taken down, that does not stop you from disseminating that image more widely. Um, but there are going to be reasons such as that. Um, and that's why we do need to reduce the barriers to make it easier, to make it quicker and more efficient and proficient to actually take these cases to court. Um, one of the core barriers is not being able to start that discourse with your own families. I mean, I've, I've spoken to people before um, I've actually got a, a female friend who was a victim and she gave me per permission to talk about her in, in one of my lectures once, like the, the whole story, which I, which I won't share here, obviously. Um, but, but she told me that like 
she sat on that knowledge for weeks, like two or three weeks, because she didn't want to share that with her family and her boyfriend because she didn't want them to think, you know, the kind of victim blaming scenario. So it's harrowing to hear. Um, how prevalent is revenge porn and what do we know about the characteristics of the victims? So quite prevalent um, in terms of, so I, th I think I've said before that most people think it's kind of uploading to dedicated revenge porn sites, giving those um, names, phone numbers, but it's not all that. It can just be sharing these images with friends and family or people that aren't even in that social circle. Um, so we don't kind of know the kind of in-depth prevalence of that, but you can imagine it's quite high. Um, and the characteristics of the victims. So typically we do see those as being um, female victims around about the kind of um, early adulthood, late teens and um, predominantly. But I think it's important to know that actually this does happen to everyone and can happen to anyone. And wrapping up, I think um, with Kim, with all the OnlyFans buzz going around, um, and I knew this question was going to come up. I, I was surprised. Um, with all the OnlyFans buzz going around, um, does the redistribution of sexual pictures that are consensually posted by the person in their OnlyFans fall into the category? So I've actually looked at this. Um, in the terms and conditions, you are not allowed to download and disseminate any images. Uh, so yes, it does. Um, if you're going back to the kind of original kind of conceptualization of revenge porn, the images um, can't normally be seen in the social sphere and those images aren't. And for those of you that are kind of still in the chat that don't actually know too much about OnlyFans, it's essentially a site whereby you can share private sexual images of yourself. They don't have to be sexual images, but, you know, um, to other people on this kind of monthly subscriber basis. And so what we're talking about in that question is do we download what happens to people that download those images and share them? Yes, it would be classed. Um, have blackmail circumstances been included? I know somebody who was hacked and blackmailed. Yes, 100%. Uh, I mean, so in, in, in the book, we try to move away from the kind of revenge aspect to look at other kind of rationales for um, offences and for those individuals being um, like, why would we commit to those offences? And although there's a sexual nature, although there's the revenge nature, there's the coercion nature, um, but there also the, is the, um, it's, it's labelled sex extortion in terms that we're using sexual images of other people's to financially extort them for money. And yes, that would very much kind of uh, fit in with that. So yeah, awesome. I will pass you back to Craig, I think, for a wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, yeah, thank you very much for everyone who's joined us uh, today we've um, i think i can speak for dean and say we absolutely love talking about uh the stuff that we're doing and this is is one strand of research that we're really passionate about uh so as you can see there's lots of kind of irons in the fire there's lots of things that uh we could be doing and there's things that we will be doing and um, if there's anything that you do want to get involved with uh, in relation to any of this do just get in touch with us uh, our emails are on the slides that you can access um through the chat of, uh, of this stream um, but like I say these slides will go online uh, probably to YouTube in the next uh, day or so uh, so you'll be able to watch it back there if there's anything that maybe we skipped over too quickly um, you can get kind of you know, some catch up on that I suppose um, but yeah thank you very much um, there will be more of this kind of stuff coming out from the psychology department at NCU over the next uh, year or so uh, so do keep checking back for on the NCU psychology Twitter feed um, you'll see kind of updates as they come up for them. So they'll be the same kind of thing where it's, it's on this team's stream uh, with the event, uh, event right page for you to sign up on. But thanks very much for, uh, for joining us today. We've had a great time. I hope you've kind of enjoyed and learned something from uh, what we've been saying. Um, but yeah, that's us for now. So thank you very much for joining us.